Thanks, Christian. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, sort of uh, feels strange to be in this environment, for sure. <laughs> but uh, I guess we'll get, all get used to it. Uh, uh, I come from the sort of the theoretical end of the spectrum in computer science and communication. And today, I'll try to tell you about communication versus computation. So by communication, think cell phone, emails, messages that you send around. Computation, things like you do with your laptop. Uh, what I want to tell you, sort of pull you back uh, to the history or the development of these things. A very interesting thing about these objects is that these are fundamentally interconnected. I mean, there is no way you can build a computer if it doesn't have very good communication within the computer. There's no way you can build a very good communication device if these communication devices do not encode and uh, decode information and so on, and these are all computational tasks. So these are fundamentally interdependent technologies. So historically, how did they look? Well, the technologies and the products and the companies that you can think about, they all sort of emerged almost independently, almost tried to say, well, we'll stay away from the other field. Uh, over the years, this is how we really thought about our communication devices, about our computing devices. And uh, later on, these devices that we were building started adding on the other capabilities. So if you had a computer, it would start doing a little bit of email, maybe gr bring some data in, et cetera. Uh, if you had a communication device, then you would start of slowly letting it calculate your phone bill, maybe. Um, so you, you added these things as an afterthought. And today, of course, we are in an environment where you can't really tell the difference between uh, whether your device is a computer or a communicator and so on. So these are fundamentally integrated. But is this integration sort of going on very well at the very, very core levels? And I would say actually no. These are both technologies which are built on very, very deep theories. And uh, some sort of seminal names come up, and in particular two names. The theory of computing owes its origins to Turing. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, enough to tell you why I think there's something new that's needed. And Shannon uh, developed the theory of communication. These are from works from the 1930s and the 1940s. And uh, what I want to tell you is that these are very, very well-separated theories. There was a brick wall separating them, and these theories have stayed that way. And uh, there is time, I mean, if the products are integrated, we don't have an option to keep it this way. We really need to do something to merge the two. What and why? So what's the consequences of the wall? Let's understand the fundamental principles governing the two theories. Computing relies on this theory called, principle called universality. There is one machine that you can build that can be programmed to do whatever you want. You don't have to build a new machine every time you want to do a new piece of software. This is remarkable. This has been the reason why we are so productive in this field. But this is at odds with the theory of communication. Communication principle is a centralized design. Somebody builds these devices which have certain sort of modes of behavior hardwired into them and then deploys them. You start interfering with any one of these communication devices and start programming on, on your own, you are at risk. So these devices are devices you should not program. So this is clearly a contradiction, but does it matter? I mean, so um, I, it's, it's a little too short a time period for me to tell you all about the theory and so on. So I'll try to build a little bit of a metaphor to explain to you what a theory should do for a practice, okay? The theory should be a foundation for practice. This is my lame attempt at building a foundation. And you build your applications on top of this foundation. All right? So lesson number one, that's pretty clear. Communication and computing, unfortunately, are somehow not pitched at the same levels. All right? So let's try to see what are our options when we try to build devices based on these. Uh, here's, I see sort of three options over here, okay? Uh, something's not going to be working well, or you just abandon the other theory. And so you have sort of three options sitting over here. So let me tell you a little bit of, of good news and some bad news. The good news is that we are mostly in option two or three. Your devices that you think are both communicating and computing are really inherently one of the two. They're not doing the two. The bad news is, of course, there's lots of lost opportunities. And it's even worse. I mean, these machines that you work with are constantly vulnerable. There's always this inefficiency. I mean, it's kind of remarkable that both theories were built on efficiency 
on very incompatible levels. The result is inefficiency. And what do I mean by that? Very simple. You turn your machine on, and it says, I want to communicate with the world to figure out how to update my software, and I'm waiting. This is not efficient use of my time. I mean, maybe a great use of the computer's time, but it's not efficient use of my time. And these incompatibilities that keep arising every time you plug your machine into a projector, things could go wrong. Yesterday, my clicker wasn't working. Um, uh, there's lots and lots and lots of room for incompatibilities, and we tend to deal with them on an ad hoc basis. This cannot be good for us. Some very sample concrete questions that we have started doing, but I'm, I'm afraid we're in a very precarious position is we are turning all the information that we have in libraries into digital libraries. Uh, will this data survive forever when the devices that we are using currently to read this information, when they are extinct? I mean, we need to be sure that this could happen. And this is something that we don't know if it can be done theoretically, and we don't know how it will work out in practice. Um, we can look to our own past and say, well, you know, it looks like things are very stable, but stability is often defined in terms of the five-year horizon. Which library of five years old would you consider worth your while? So again, sort of projecting from your laptop, I mean, so many times that so many different things could go wrong, I cannot number the possibilities. But it would be lovely to have something which just says, machines can communicate freely even though I'm tampering with them all the time. There should be some way of doing it, and I think there will be. And the time is too short for me to tell you all about it, but I think that a new theory is in the making. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Madhu. I think Madhu sets a good example. No enforcing necessary. We have time for sort of Christian two, was three built questions. a little bit taller than me. <laughs> so we have time for some questions, and I let Madhu direct the audience. Okay. Questions anywhere? It looks like we're still waking up. Really? Do you have a question, Jennifer, for Madhu? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can you give us a um, one-minute version of what your new theory is? So uh, I cannot give you a one-minute version so, of the new theory. Uh, however, what I can try to tell you, um, what I can try I, to I tell you. I think you have three minutes, actually. So. I, I, I see how much time there is, and I see who's enforcing it. Uh, I'm not going to take risks with this. Uh, what I'm trying to do, what we are trying to do, is somehow try to emulate how humans communicate, uh, which is a lot more robust and without the same sort of uh, rigidity that we associate with computers communicating with each other. Now, uh, this starts to sort of take us into unknown, uncertain territories, because we really don't know what humans are doing when they're communicating. There are entire teams of neurologists, psychologists, sociologists who've all been looking at this. We're trying to learn from all of them. Uh, but at the same time, we think you know, computers are going to do a few things that all these humans haven't been doing. So uh, it needs to be a little bit more broader than all of this. At the same time, uh, unfortunately, our background is in mathematics. So we are also sort of forced into adopting a mathematical uh, framework for all of this. We're trying to put it all together. Uh, I don't know how successful this will be, but I certainly think that this is something that we need to think about. And, uh, and there are papers on my website, but there are also, you know, every one of you, I sort of encourage you to sort of think about this question. If you have ideas, uh, it'll be wonderful to see the world developing in this direction. Okay. Okay, let's thank Madhu again.